from the day that Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command and ate of the fruit and brought the curse of sin into the very DNA of all humanity and creation, God foretold a divine plan of redemption. First recorded in Genesis 3.15, God informed Satan that day that one day he would bring to pass the means by which redemption would come to mankind, and how the serpent's head would be crushed, and the heel of this Redeemer would be bruised. These recorded words in Scripture of future events are known as prophecy. And since that day, 6,000 years ago, mankind has looked ahead to that which would come. They looked back to that which was promised, and they looked around to how they and we now should best think and live and plan. Well, that was true of Adam, Enoch, Noah. It was true of Abraham, who was promised a future, a family, and a nation through which this Redeemer would come and bless the entire world. And based on this prophecy, Abraham began to look ahead to that which would come, as is told to us in Hebrews 11:11, 11, 11, where Scripture records, For Abraham looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Old Testament saints looked ahead. Old Testament prophets recorded that which would come. The disciples of Jesus' day, they wanted to know what was in the next days. And when Jesus was about to depart, they wanted to know, as in Matthew 24 and elsewhere, the evidence or the observable signs of the time that would indicate the timing of Christ's second coming. And Jesus Himself, responding to this desire, told them, and us, that we are not to be ignorant of the times and what is to come, so that we don't walk in the darkness as others who have no hope. Jesus said expressly in Matthew 24, 6, to not be perplexed when we see indications of coming perilous times, because, as He said, these things simply must come to pass. And later, the Apostle Paul then reassured the church at Thessalonica that knowing the comprehensive plan of God, and the certainty of things to come, we can therefore comfort one another. And it's in this foundational purpose of providing knowledge and comfort that I have invited today Pastor Carl Brogy, Senior Pastor of Community Bible Church of Beaufort, South Carolina, to join Isaac and me for a two-part series entitled, Comforting Words in Days of Confusion, Israel, Prophecy, and the Rapture. And with that, I welcome to today, really honored to have with us Dr. Carl Brogy. Carl, thank you so much for taking time from your schedule to be with Isaac and I and our viewers all across the country. Sam, it's a pleasure to be with you and Isaac here and stand in the gap, and I look forward to our time together today. Uh, uh, Carl, let's start this off. You are uh, a pastor who spends a lot of time on prophecy. Matter of fact, you're in a series as we tape this program of like 14 or 15, I think, and I've listened to most of them. Really very, very good. Here's my personal question, uh, just a question for you personally to get going here. Why do you personally view it necessary as a pastor of a large church, actually, to spend so much time on prophecy? Well, it's a great question. Uh, obviously, about one-third of the Scripture is prophetic in nature. And with that being said, if you're going to teach the whole counsel of Scripture, you cannot ignore prophecy. Typically, I te teach through entire books of the Bible, and sooner or later you're going to hit a prophetic passage. And nearly about 50% of the prophecy is yet to be fulfilled because it's in relation to future events, Christ's kingdom, and so forth. But it's important, one, because we're commanded to teach the whole counsel of Scripture. Two, we have the example of the Lord Jesus. The longest single answer he ever gave to a question was to Peter, James, John, and Andrew on the Mount of Olives, and he went through it in great discourse, we call it the Olivet Discourse, about his return from heaven. Uh, Paul addresses questions to the church at Thessalonica concerning prophecy. We have his example, and he was only in Thessalonica, according to the book of Acts, for three weeks, and yet in three weeks' time he preached about prophecy. But prophecy is important because it's the blessed hope. It gives us perspective. It helps us to really remove the confusion of the day that we live in and to have a sharp, clear perspective of future events so that, as Jesus said, when you see these things happen, you need not fear. 
many, many other reasons why a pastor should preach prophecy, but those are some critical ones right there. And, uh, and those are important, and, uh, and I think our viewers right now are to say, well, I'm gonna, I need to stay tuned to this program because the excitement of the knowledge of what God's Word says does provide, ladies and gentlemen, um, clarity in times of confusion. And I hope, as you stay tuned to this program, you will, in fact, learn a lot about what God's Word says and the, and the comfort that it can bring. We'll be back in just a moment. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator or frontline combatant? Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap, and today our, our special guest is Dr. Carl Brogy, the senior pastor at uh, the Community Bible Church in Beaufort, South Carolina. And uh, Dr. Brogy, um, we're just glad that you're willing to let us ask you all these questions because this is the, the, this topic of prophecy can be so confusing, as Sam alluded to. And here you are, you're a preacher who likes to go through verse by verse, line by line, expository preaching, we call that. And, and when you go through it that way, you're going to come across all kinds of things, including prophecy. And so you've, you know, you've taught your congregation, and you're also on the radio, and so you do this, and you love to just really dig into it, almost like a microscope when you're going through Scripture. And what we're trying to do on this program is look at it from a telescope, from the you know, 10,000 foot level. And so um, we're, I know that we just, we're going to try to squeeze a whole bunch of stuff in. So thank you ahead for letting us, you know, ask you all these questions. But could you just kind of give us that, that outward, you know, 10,000 foot level context on biblical, pro not just, you know, what I think prophecy is, but biblical prophecy, kind of defining it and describing it for us? Well, prophecy simply defined is uh, history pre-written. Only God knows the future, and of course, He wrote the future ever before it happened, not in vague generalities, but in specific ways, which is one argument among others for the uniqueness of Holy Scripture. But with that said, the big picture, 10,000-foot level, God created us to have a friendship with Himself. Uh, we rebelled against God, and so God gives the first prophecy in Scripture, Genesis 3.15, of a coming Savior. He begins to unfold it through the establishment of a nation with Abraham. He tightens the focus. He said, out of that Jewish nation, from a particular tribe, Judah, out of a particular family, David, the Messiah, will come. Jesus comes, dies, buried, resurrected, ascended, and right now he's building his church, but he's coming again. And so his second coming is really unfolded in a number of events. And so when we speak often of the prophetic issues in relation to end times, we're looking at those coming events, the rapture, the catching up of the church, while we're in heaven, we'll be evaluated for our service to the Lord. We'll celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. On the earth will be the great tribulation, ultimately followed by the return of Christ to the earth, his coming millennial kingdom, and then eternity future. That's the big scan of events. <laughs> and Carl, you did that fantastically. And I know that um, as people can grasp that, uh, but you take weeks and weeks to take into each one of these in detail. And that's the great thing about prophecy, but this, that's a great overview. Let me come back and ask you now, um, I asked you personally at the beginning why you are personally motivated as a pastor to spend so much time, and you shared that. Uh, and a Isaac just talked about the defining, the definition, you gave it. Um, the description of it broadly, you just gave that. Now let me talk to you about the purpose of prophecy. Go a little further into that. Uh, I know that in the first few verses of, for instance, the book of Revelation, uh, the Apostle John says, lays out three things, that there are benefits for knowing prophecy. He says, blessed are those who 
read, who hear, listen to it, be read, and then obey. Now those, those are benefits, but there could be more. So take and expand, if you don't mind, further on those things and other things. The purpose for prophecy. Why does God make 30% of the Bible prophecy and bring that to bear? And therefore, I mean, I would assume then why pulpits ought to be preaching it. Well, again, if a pastor's not preaching biblical prophecy, he's really not doing what God's called him to do. But there are many practical motivations with virtually every single text of Scripture that speaks of future things. There's an accompanying command as to what we should do. Uh, Jesus in the Olivet Discourse said, when you see these things happen, don't fear. I told you in advance. So prophecy, among other things, removes fear in the midst of great confusion, because we live in a day where the events seem like it's confusing. It seems like things are falling apart when, biblically speaking, they're actually coming together. Prophecy motivates you to share your faith. Uh, Jesus said, an hour is coming when no man can uh, continue to minister. There's a lot of things we'll do in heaven that we do on earth. We'll worship in heaven, we'll pray in heaven, we'll study scripture in heaven, but there'll be no evangelism in heaven. That period of time will be closed. And so now's the opportunity. And so when we understand that an hour comes when we can no longer share, it should motivate us. It motivates us to holy living. Peter, when he speaks of the end of the millennium, when God creates a new heaven and a new earth, he said, since these things are going to happen this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy living and living reverently or fear in a holy fear before the Lord? So it motivates us to a different kind of lifestyle. And of course, John says the one who focuses on these things purifies himself as he is pure. Hmm. Well, Dr. Brogy, uh, you know, we we're on TV right now, but we are much different than uh, some of the people who give a bad name to evangelicalism or to Christianity. Uh, you know, people talk about, oh, those televangelists, especially a few decades ago, uh, that was kind of a, a big thing. But um, there are pastors who, you know, maybe they talk about prophecy and it's not biblical prophecy. You know, again, the stereotypical televangelist who, oh, I'm getting a prophecy of the Lord that somebody's going to okay. give me a big check and, you know, write okay. all this, you know, blessings to me. But I think a lot of the pastors in my generation have gone, that maybe the pendulum has swung the other direction, that they don't even speak about prophecy. And in fact, um, our, our ministry here, Stand in the Gap, is part of the American Pastors Network, and Sam is the president of the American Pastors Network and, and some of our good friends, um, George Barna, for example, who does a lot of research with pastors, they, they're saying that there are many, many pulpits who are silent on many, many doctrines because they want to be positive. They want to uh, build friends. They want to build, they think they can build a congregation by only talking about nice things that people all agree with. And they're afraid that certain things that they might preach on might be considered divisive and so therefore, you know, they've been staying away from it. But we know from research, we know from, you know, friends like Ken Ham talking about people who try to avoid talking about creation or things. They're actually missing out that there are many people in the pews wanting to hear this. Why, why are they missing out? Those pastors who don't go through expository like you, maybe they go through verse by verse and they kind of skip over the prophetic things that are in, in Scripture. But why, what are they missing out on? Uh, why, why do you think that it's a mistake to avoid talking about prophecy? Well, there's a number of reasons why pastors are not preaching biblical prophecy. Mm. Uh, sadly, in a lot of seminaries, it's no longer addressed. And it used to be a major part of any Masters of Divinity or THM program. But sadly, it's sometimes taught in one three-hour course, four or five realms of theology, when it needs to be a dedicated focus, because so much of Scripture is on it. I think a lot of pastors, too, Isaac, they don't want to be associated with the charlatans, these tele-evangelists, these date-setters, and they think, well, if I preach on prophecy, I'm going to be viewed as a nut. Well, all the more reason to preach on prophecy, because we have to dispel what has been done largely by unsaved people. It's largely date setters who have not been regenerated by the Spirit of God who've done this, but sometimes foolish people seeking to sell books or raise money on the basis of sensationalism. But you can't grow a healthy congregation apart from teaching Bible prophecy. 
And unfortunately, there was in the 1980s a movement, the seeker sensitive church movement, that basically said, if you want to grow a big church, there's issues you stay away from. And I think what we did is we gathered more terror than we did wheat in the process. And we did a huge disservice to the church, making them not discerning to sound doctrine. And it's opened the door for gross apostasy. Hmm. Um, I, I tell you, for those watching, I, I am sure, Carl, that there are many people watching, because I hear from people all over the country who are saying, boy, I wish my pastor would speak about the prophetical events, because we are all aware, as we do this program, we are all aware that we are in a world of, trans, of, of enormous transition. Things are happening fast, it seems, and only when I understand biblical prophecy do I say, ah, not to be worried, boy, oh boy, the pieces are coming together, which brings me to the next part. Uh, I want to talk to you about Israel, because we said uh, comfort in days of confusion. You and I have already referenced Abraham. God mm -hmm. came to Abraham and said, I'm going to make you a promise. I'm going to make you a great people, great nation. I'm going to give you land, and, and through it I'm going to uh, bless the entire world, obviously referring to uh, Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, coming. Um, but then, uh, so here's the question relative to Israel. Can you separate biblical prophecy from Israel, number one, and number two then, as we look at prophecy today, and we look at Israel today, um, is the fact that Israel is back in the land today significant? And tie that into the biblical clock. In other words, very quickly, Israel we know gathered, regathered in 1948. Uh, did that start a biblical clock ticking as an example? Put that whole piece together if you don't mind. No, you cannot separate biblical prophecy from Israel because the covenant that God made with Abraham was unconditional in nature. And so God is going to love Israel with an everlasting love. He said in Jeremiah 31, as long as the stars and the moon and the sun are up in the sky, that's how long he'll be committed to Israel. But what's happened is we've replaced Israel with the church. We call the church today the new Israel. And in America, approximately 100 million nominal slash evangelical Christians together say that the church is the new Israel, that God has no future for the Jew. And so what they are forced to do is spiritualize prophecy and apply a different principle of interpretation, what we call hermeneutic, uh, to the prophetic sections of Scripture. Uh, John Calvin wrote a commentary on every single book of the Bible except Revelation, because he didn't know what to do with it, because he approached a prophecy with a different principle of interpretation. And that's a huge problem in our day. But Israel back in the land is prophetically significant. God said at the end of time, before the return of Messiah to the earth, he'd gather the Jews from the four corners of the world. He could have done it in 400 AD or 1000 AD, but he waited almost two millennia, and now we are seeing it fulfilled. Hmm. And, and Carl, you answered that so succinctly and, and, and quickly, I'm going to ask you a follow-up. <laughs> and, here, and here's the follow-up question. Um, some would say, well, I trust Jesus as my Savior, faith in Jesus Christ alone, and I do not believe that God is doing anything more with Israel. You and I and, Car and Isaac would say, I do believe in faith in Jesus Christ alone, biblical salvation, but I do believe that God is not done with Israel, and the cock is now focusing again on Israel. What difference does it make in the end, which one I believe? It makes a huge difference, because if you think God is done with Israel, you really can't put together what is happening in our world. And so a lot of pastors and pulpits are, you know, promising this future revival, that things are going to turn around in America. And if God wants to bring a revival, He certainly can. But He's setting the stage for the second coming. And Scripture is clear, at the end of the age, there'll not be a revival except the one that will take place during the Great Tribulation period, where some who have never heard the gospel before will be converted. And so it leads to confusion as to 
uh, how we should view life and what our perspective should be concerning future things. And they're doing the church, I sadly, a great disservice. I love these brothers who, you know, are all millennial in their theology. You know, they're good, good men, but they're just wrong on the doctrine of future things. And they're helping to put the church asleep when the church needs to be shaken in this day because time is running out. It doesn't take rocket science theology to figure out that we're towards the end of the age because God said at the end of time, Jesus said it, Moses said it, Ezekiel said it, Jeremiah, Isaiah, that Israel back in the land is a super sign for the final program when God will bring Messiah to the earth. And even Orthodox Jews recognize that. They believe that Messiah's return for them the first time is close because they've seen a fulfillment of what the Old Testament prophet said. They're more alert than a lot of evangelicals are. <laughs> and, and Carl, what you're saying is exciting to me, and I think it's exciting to those who are watching us. When we come back, um, we're gonna have, ask you to do some now application and say, all right, now in light of these things, how should it be affecting those who are watching and living today? Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different. Welcome back, and uh, we're finishing up our first program with Dr. Carl Brogy, and it's really been a pleasure. We, uh, we love having pastors on the program and talking to, to you, Pastor Brogy, with you know, your, your experience, your ministry experience, and all the expository preaching you do that, that by, you know, forces you to have to preach on prophecy because as you go through line by line, verse by verse, it's there, but uh, you also have a radio program where people, you know, email questions to you or sometimes live questions. And so, uh, you know, we, we joke about pastors being long-winded, but you're also quick-winded because of the radio. And so you, we have been able just to rapid fire a bunch of questions. But as we wrap up this first program, what should we take away? We look at the fulfillment of, you know, Israel now being a nation, 1948. Uh, we see this, uh, as, as Sam called it, the clock is ticking. The prophetic clock is ticking. Um, what, what kind of motivation, what, what kind of, um, how should we be looking at these events as Christians? Well, there are no signs for the rapture. The rapture could happen at any moment. That's always been true. Could happen 10 years, uh, 50 years, a thousand years after Pentecost, if God so chose. But the second coming is a prophetically driven event. I tell people when you go into Walmart around October and you see the Christmas decorations go up, you know that Thanksgiving's near because Thanksgiving <laughs> precedes Christmas. Mm. Well, likewise, when you see God setting the stage for the second coming, you know the rapture is that much closer. Mm. And so God said at the end of time, he doesn't use the term last days, but latter times, which is a term specific to the end of the age before Messiah comes and steps on the earth, that he would gather the Jews from the four corners of the world. That's a super sign. We're seeing other things. It would be like the days of Noah, those are days of lawlessness and violence and immorality. The coming of the Son of Man, he said, would be like the days of Lot. Those are days of sexual perversion. There will be gross apostasy of falling away from the faith uh, in preparation for the coming apostasy. So sign after sign after sign, globalism. You have to have a global mentality for the Antichrist to rule. All of these things are happening in our day, which should lend perspective to the true believer we need to be prepared. We need to be telling our loved ones because the clock is running out and God gave us his time clock in advance and we need to be faithful to what he's called us to do. It's called the Great Commission. Uh, Brother Carl, fantastic. And uh, you'll be back with us next week. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I know that you have been encouraged by what you've seen today. I have been. <laughs> and uh, next week, I'll tell you where we're going to go. We're going to talk next week about the uh, prophecy and chronology, the sequence of events. Why is that important to know? 
Uh, we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about the uh, the rapture. We're going to talk about the events that are a part of the second coming. It's not just one event; it's a number of things that are connected in that second coming to help put together all of this. Why? So that in these days of confusion, we as God's people who know who Jesus Christ is, the Son of God, through faith in Him alone, we can be comforted. We can be motivated to share the gospel like never before, and that we can be offering light and hope to a dark world who is increasingly in dismay. Thank you for watching us today. Be back with us next week for part two of uh, Comfort and Prophecy in These Days. And Isaac and I will look forward to being with you. Let us know that you're watching to us, communicate to us, partner with us in prayer and finances, please. <music>